Well, good morning and a very warm welcome. Grace, mercy and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We begin with our first song, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. So we have a few moments of quiet as we prepare for our prayers of penitence. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now the collect for the presentation of Christ in the temple. Almighty and ever-living God, clothed in majesty, whose beloved Son was this day presented in the temple in substance of our flesh, grant that we may be presented to you with pure and clean hearts, by your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now Aidan's going to bring us our reading.
The Lord be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Holy Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favour of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to thee. May I speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm guessing that had we been there, you could have blinked and it would all have been over in a matter of moments. The it would be something that was part of normal life. If you were a reasonably faithful Jew at the time, you knew the rules. Everybody did. You fitted in just a normal part of life that we really didn't give much thought to. And it's just the same for us. Lots of things, actions, activities, observations that we so take for granted in everyday, everyday life, even in light of everything that's happened here in the last 12 months. But it's the different things that we tend to notice, the exceptions. It's just the way we're made the different things get our attention. I'm therefore sure that no one would have given this any particular notice. Other than on the big or so-called high holy days, a constant queue of mostly couples, most with small babies, moving steadily, purposefully through the temple. Offerings then handed over, some mumbled words from a priest, and maybe a bit of a wave or other gesture. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, it's all over. Who's next? An event, 
something to be remembered for each of the parents concerned, but probably even a bit tedious for the temple staff. This particular couple and their baby, nothing out of the ordinary. In fact, very much that. And the child's mother, probably about 14, that's year 10, to parents and grandparents here. Very typical at the time. And they all look the same. This pair are one of the poorer types and they're in the majority. They can only afford the cheaper offering, but it still counts. Thank you very much. That'll do nicely. And then they're gone. The author of Luke's Gospel is very keen that you get that sense of the ordinary, almost the banal. As Mary and Joseph go through a couple of the required necessary rituals of then Jewish life, you might think. But our Gospel writer has another objective in mind. This might be bog standard, ordinary, if not a little boring, but in actual fact, it's the complete opposite. This event is a key part of a revolutionary and dramatic intervention by Almighty God in the affairs of human beings. It is unprecedented and will change the world. And something in the way that this is all playing out tells you something about what God is like. No flashing lights, no music welling up, no special effects. It's all happening in front of you in the most ordinary activities of everyday life. Can you see? I think that it's almost a bit too much for the writer of Luke's gospel to take in. So Luke tries to make sure that we know that something unique has happened. His method, tell the story, and then tell them what it means then tell the story again. And we know that that works. So Mary and Joseph, and I'm assuming their baby son, then, and still in the temple, encounter two individuals. And we won't hear about them again in scripture. One of these is a woman, another indication that whatever is to come will be an expression of inclusiveness in this overwhelmingly male-dominated society. But then, hasn't all of the child's story so far, as far as Luke is concerned, been told from the perspective and experiences of the child's mother? So, while we have the narrative of what would have been regarded as normal life for observant Jews 2,000 years ago, this baby is someone. Simeon tells us, who will be a light to the Gentiles. A few well-chosen words that explode God's mission to humanity to begin to include those others than the chosen people. It's simply revolutionary. Make no mistake. What on earth did that teenage girl make of it? Did she wonder what life might have been like had she not had that encounter with God's messenger less than 12 months beforehand? Her then best hope prior to that? Some security in a tough but normal day-to-day -day life living in an obscure village slightly off the beaten track. Mary's memories from the then last 10 months probably reeling from various levels of shock. Then in the temple, more weirdness and an explicit warning of violence of the most extreme kind. Whatever next, she must have thought. Good heavens, you wouldn't blame her if all she wanted to do was get home and disappear back into obscurity. Maybe the best she could hope for was that the baby would eventually survive childhood and inherit her husband's trade, have some dignity, and standing in the world, maybe marry and have children. One of the challenges for most Christians is to struggle with this story. The undertakings that God gives to us 
unrestrained love and support are articulated by Jesus in his adult ministry and continue to the here and now through the work of the helper, the Holy Spirit. The prayers and prayer lives of Simeon and Anna remind us of one way to live out the life of faith. We, in our turn, have to try and see in the ordinary and sometimes banal events of the here and now, let alone the pandemic, how God's intentions are playing out. And that's what Luke is trying to do through these narratives. The various Gospels all make it clear that many of those attracted to Jesus's messages found this all too hard, all too implausible. And it's not that those who live in faith have the intrinsic ability to discern the divine. The reality, I'd suggest, is that they simply stick to the search. They persevere, like in Pilgrim's Progress, taking the route that's not necessarily the easiest. The church itself continues to be challenged by all of this. Even the different names that it gives the festival we celebrate today fail to tell the whole story. Candlemas, as a name, is popular because it reminds us of that wonderful phrase uttered by Simeon, a light to the Gentiles, us. Too Catholic for some, so we'll call it the Feast of the Purification in the Temple tells you about the scriptural and cultural context, but not much else. Okay, I know I'm being a bit snippy here, but I think you get the message. Perhaps the best thing we can take away from today's gospel is hinted at in something that usually happens only today and only once a year when we're in church. The Candlemas pres or presentation in the temple liturgy asks us at that service's end to make what, seem, what seems to be the smallest of physical gestures. Before we take our ministries and missions out into the world, we collectively turn from facing east as we do at Holy Angels to the altar, to face the font at the rear of the church. Consider, the liturgy suggests, as we turn from the Christmas season, and so end it, and then look towards Lent and on to Easter, at the font, candles, which we've lit earlier, are extinguished. We move on. Jesus, until now in the form of a baby, stands with us, figuratively, inviting us to be with him for a journey, ultimately of hope, to a place beyond our own expectations and imaginative abilities, to a place that we can only try and anticipate, but which is nevertheless open to all of us. Come this way, he says, stick with me, no worries. Amen.
in our prayers today, when I say, Lord, have mercy, would you please respond, Christ, have mercy. Let us pray to the Father through Christ, who is our light and life. Father, your Christ is acclaimed as the glory of Israel. Look in mercy on your church, sharing his light. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Father, your Christ in his temple brings judgment on the world. Look in mercy on the nations who long for his justice. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Father, your Christ, who was rich for our sakes, became poor. Look in mercy on the needy, suffering with him. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Father, your Christ is the one in whom faithful servants find their peace. Look in mercy on the departed, that they may see your salvation. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Father, your Christ is revealed as the one destined to be rejected. Look in mercy on us, who now turn towards his passion. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord God, you kept faith with Simeon and Anna and showed them the infant king. Give us grace to put all our trust in your promises and the patience to wait for their fulfillment. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now a prayer for all those who have lost their lives during this pandemic. We remember before God those who have died. And we pray that God's love will surround all who mourn them now and always. Gracious God, as we remember before you the thousands who have died, surround us and all who mourn with your strong compassion. Be gentle with us in our grief. Protect us from despair and give us grace to persevere and face the future with hope. In Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. And now we join our prayers in the words our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So as we remember Jesus as the light to the world, the light to the nations, we join together to sing, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.